Okay, I'm going to admit all, so here we go. Have a great show, everybody. Hello everyone and happy National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Thank you for joining us this month for this month's Diversability Unplugged, Disability and Ableism in the Workplace. Today we dive deeper into important topics ranging from disclosing disabled identity to sharing resources for better inclusion, accessibility, and support within the workplace. But before we begin, I wanna give everyone time to join and describe um, the image that's on the screen. On the screen, we see a cream background with Navy text. At the top are the words, please remember to keep all mics muted. Below are the words, diversability, unplugged, disability and ableism in the workplace, which is above four round pictures of our panel, starting from left to right, Ryan Honick, he, him, Internal Communications Manager, USPTO, Angela Fowler, she, her, Accessibility Specialist, Ad Hoc, Lucic Gasparian, she, her, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Consultant, and Jacob Levy, he, him, Career Coach, Special Educator. Beneath the pictures to the left is a Navy banner with the white font, Moderator. Ariel Dance, PhD, she, her, writer, diversability, along with a picture of her. Right aligned at the bottom are the words, join our online communities, Diversability Leadership Collective, HTTPS colon slash slash D-I-V-E-R-S-A-B-I-L-I-T-Y dot mn.co with the words, join now and get your first week free. Centered at the bottom are two logos, a Navy Diversability and Interpreter Now. Now, without further ado, let's begin. Thank you again for joining us. My name is Ariel Dance, she, her. I am a black woman with a buzz cut purple cat eye glasses, and I'm wearing a green printed top, and my background's blurry. I have the honor of being the writer here at Diversability, and we are an entirely disabled team, and we are dedicated to elevating um, the stories and disability pride. So uh, together through community and conversation, we're really hoping today is gonna be a blast. Um, tonight, we are joined by other powerhouses on this panel. I'm really excited to be amongst these amazing people. Um, let's get right into introductions and image descriptions. Is everyone ready for that? Uh, Angela, can I start and begin with you? So I'm, excuse me, um, I'm Angela Fowler. I'm uh, totally blind. I also have a significant hearing loss. So those are the fun facts about me. Um, I'm coming to you from Northern California, just north of the Sacramento area. So it's good to see all these Californians in the house. Um, big shout out for the Golden State. Um, I've been working in the accessibility space in one capacity for another, uh, uh, for a number of years, and we'll get into that more later. Um, I'm a parent. Um, 
I have a 16 year old son and I also have two furry children, a dog and a cat. Um, and um, it, it's, it's good, it's good to, uh, to be here. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Awesome, Angela, welcome. I'm gonna pass it to Ryan. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's a really, really great um, opportunity to talk about some very important things tonight. Um, I am Ryan Honick. I am a disability advocate, uh, speaker, and professional persuader. It's what I like to um, like to call myself. And um, I am joined oftentimes, although he's currently taking a nap, by my service dog Pico. Um, he is also a big impetus for a lot of the advocacy that I do, and helps it get a lot more attention because he's a lot better at camera things than I am. And I will keep it short and I will leave it there for now. Mm -hmm. I hope that he makes an appearance on camera. I would love it. <laughs> um, we're still waiting for Lucic, I believe. So I'm gonna skip to Jacob. Thank you so much. Hey everyone, my name is Jacob Levy. I am a career coach, um, special educator and disability advocate. Um, I acquired a learning disability at birth due to hydrocephalus. Um, hydrocephalus is essentially means water on the brain or brain, uh, brain hemorrhage. Um, and I'm super excited to be here. I've been part of the DLC for a hot minute and yeah, look forward to this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob, and welcome to our panelists. Um, I say we dive right in and start the conversation. So um, there may be certain questions I'll probe you a little more. Um, even if you've looked at the questions, you may not know what I'm gonna ask, so get ready. <laughs> so our first question, you know, as we know, October is uh, National Disability Employment Awareness Month. So can you tell us, um, each of you, tell us a little bit about your employment journey um, and kind of how you've gotten to where you are today in terms of like your career? I will start with Angela again. All right, so a blind person has a difficult time just walking into your neighborhood market slash fast food place slash whatever and getting a job. And this is for one of two reasons. This is because of accessibility barriers, but more importantly, it's because of attitudinal barriers. People don't believe that a blind person can just up and work an entry level job like that. Most people don't. We've got a long way to go in terms of education. But luckily for me, I was actually able to land my first, my, my first long-term job. I'd done a few part-time things and, and whatnot, but my first full-time job, because I actually ended up on the board and actually helping to design, I, I, it, it, it was weird, I helped to design my own program, um, the program for older individuals who are blind uh, at the Center for Independent Living up here, uh, just north of Sacramento, California. Um, so I got to know them and they ended up hiring me to, uh, to, to run the program. And, and from there, I transitioned to the community college. Um, and ad hoc, the first job I got where I applied for the job and I didn't know anybody who, at the time who was working here. Um, you know, you, you, uh, they say it's easier to get a job when you have a job and, and that, is, that is very true. So I went from basically going to where I knew people to actually proving and building a resume at those jobs and actually, you know, ending up here. Thanks, Angela. I'm going to come back to something else you said, but I'm going to go to Jacob for uh, next, and then I'll come back to something else you said. Go on, Jacob. Thank you so much. Um, so I, if you look at my resume, it looks like a total roadmap, like a ridiculous, crazy roadmap. But so in a nutshell, um, I went to school for music. Um, I have played music ever since I was a kid. Um, I was an amateur jazz musician for a decade, love music. Um, and then I got into special education 
Um, I'm also a special education teacher. In this crazy world we live in, I teach 100% remote um, in on the south side of Chicago, and I live in Metro Detroit. I've been doing that since uh, December 2020. So it's a pretty unique scenario, especially due to the mass teacher shortage. Um, I'm sure even if you're not in education, it's, it exists. Um, and then I got into career coaching. Uh, I think just due to my, my disability, definitely had a lot of struggles with my career, um, biases, a lot of trouble at getting accommodations. They never, back in the day, they, they didn't teach this kind of thing in school. Um, and so I was doing a lot of side hustles. I did video editing. I did like a little bit of everything. And I met a career coach and I ended up doing um, video editing for his content. And so basically he, I learned his process while editing his content. And so at the end of um, helping him out, he found me a job and he was basically like, well, you want to just come work for me? Um, that's kind of how I got into career coaching. And then right before the pandemic, I decided to go off on my own to help uh, to create a niche. And I was helping all sorts of job seekers, you know, from all walks of life, all industries. But I wanted to specifically hone in to help job seekers with disabilities. Mm, thanks for sharing that. OK. I'm hearing some themes already. Um, Ryan, how about you? What's your journey? Uh, thanks. Um, I appreciate uh, the question, Ariel. And I will tell you, my journey, I've been very fortunate. I have spent the last uh, roughly eight years with one federal agency um, and in a couple of different roles related to communication. And uh, prior to that was with another federal agency and I've also worked with a global PR firms. So I've actually had the good fortune to be in a couple of different positions and learn a lot about how each of them uh, functions and how each of them uh, focuses their, their goals and communication. But particularly as I've engaged with each of them, I've learned the differences, differences and distinctions, both subtle and overt about how they work with folks with disabilities and and accommodating, or as Jacob uh, alluded to, sometimes not accommodating so greatly, um, that can be a little bit of a of a trick. And you learn a little bit about that with each each new place you land, uh, and, and learn to navigate some of that. And um, so my journey has been very educational. It's taught me a lot. It's also made me very tired, as I'm sure a lot of folks on this panel can test to. Um, but it's something that I take great pride in, and I'm glad to be here and share whatever wisdom I have with uh, with folks uh, here tonight. Thanks, Ryan. So I'm hearing that we have a variety of backgrounds. So that really excites me because we're going to talk about workplace. And I don't want people to think that we're talking about workplace from one lens, right? We're coming from an educational background. I'm coming from a nonprofit background. So, you know, if we need to sprinkle that into, um, you know, ad hoc is different than federal work. You know, we're all coming to this from a completely different lens. And then Jacob, you even brought in that side hustle, right? And I think, um, I think that could be generational. I know a lot of people say like millennials are good for a side hustle. And so um, that's also really a good part about it too, a good part of this discussion, kind of like, what did you have to do for yourself? And how did you have to create space for yourself when there wasn't a space for you? So um, I'm really excited to, to dive deeper into this conversation. So um, we kind of touched on this a little bit, but as far as ableism and bias go, um, they go hand in hand. So what biases have you seen and have you faced throughout your career? And how did you combat those in your workplace over your entire career? So um, I'm going to go, I'm going to start with Jacob. Um, so I actually remember the first time I experienced it, I got called into my manager's office with HR um, and they were concerned about my performance. And this, this is, you know, disability in the workplace, especially on a corporate level, um, like I've never been exposed to it. Um, I didn't, like I said, in school, they didn't teach about like accommodations, modifications, um, checking the box, so to speak. So it was kind of shell shocking to me because um, I've never experienced it. And it was pretty, um, 
I felt uh, like segregated, to be honest, because it was like, it was literally like pointing a finger. Um, and I feel like, and they, and I felt exposed because they were like looking through my social media and things like that. Um, so, I mean, the bias and the ableism definitely is uh, alive and well. Um, to be honest, I'm still working on combating every day. Um, I was just giving a, um, a speaking engagement at a disability ERG on like how to ask for accommodations um, and modifications, things like that. So employers definitely, they want to know, they want more knowledge on the topic. I think it's just things take, things go at like a glacial pace in, in certain sectors. So I think it's just an ongoing kind of uphill battle. Someone else want to go or want to build off of that? I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Um, I think one of the things, um, which I'll, and I, I thought about this as Jacob uh, was saying this, there's a glacial pace to different organizations and nowhere is that more evident than federal government, unfortunately. And the first time that I really became aware of, of just how prevalent ableism could be was, uh, you know, the, the first time that I was asking for accommodations and the levels and hoops that were required to jump through to do something that it, at the time, you know, was so basic. And I just mm -hmm. thought, I thought, you know, the, the level of required documentation for me to get through the bureaucracy to, to do my job, which I was hired to do. So there's a little bit of a disconnect because the assumption when you initially hire uh, a new hire is you, you're hiring them because you, you're valuing their skill set and their competence in the role. And then when you go to leadership and say, this is what I need, need to do it successfully, suddenly that bureaucracy rears its ugly head and you end up hitting this wall of trying to prove yourself in micro ways that most people don't have to. And um, so I, I thought about that off of Jacob's comment and I will, uh, I will uh, pause the mic on that. Can I piggyback off that? Oh yes. I like to say that accommodation is what happens, what you need when access fails. So, you know, the, the biggest challenge that I have experienced or one of the biggest challenges is inaccessible software. You know, the software you use to keep track of client information or to, you know, do basic HR things. Um, it's, yeah. Um, and when the software is not accessible, you need an accommodation but if we can work with the company, the manufacturers of this software and make the software accessible so that we can just sit down and do our doggone job from day one, then there wouldn't be a need to go through all this bureaucracy. And one more barrier separating us from everybody else would be, would be torn down. And you, know, you mentioned proving yourself in a way that most people don't have to you know blind people get questions like how are you going to find your way around the building you know well i'm gonna learn it and you know it's things like that and one wonders how the heck are we going to get hired if they're wondering how we're going to find our way around the building you know how how do they how can we get them mentally from the, that, that very basic find your way around a building to complete and excel at the, the functions required, the functions of the job? And, and, and it's just, it's, it's frustrating because the ignorance about blindness and about all disabilities is so pervasive that you feel like you're, you feel like you're, screaming into a void sometimes, you know? 
and this is this is universal. I'm not talking about one thing specifically. My my current job is actually <laughs> a lot better than uh, than than some of the others I've experienced. But it's just yeah. You're answering the question though well because the question was about your overall career, right? And so right. you're touching on you know your experience, but you're also um, leaning into one of our next questions, which was about the types of accommodations that we have to essentially fight for. Um, we actually asked our leadership collective, our DLC, you know, what type of accommodations they love about their workplace and what type of accommodations they wish their workplace had and um, accessible equipment and technology was on that list. So, you know, you're speaking to that. Um, but I loved what you said. I wrote it down. Accommodations are what we need when access fails, right? And so what could we be doing better? What did you have to, what do you remember, you know, fighting for, I guess, or begging for, or what are you still asking for? And what could your employers be doing better to improve those accommodations for you? And maybe it's not this current employer. Maybe it's an employer you left, but like your wish list of things you wish you had, you know? Can I take a crack at that? Oh, please do. I'm kind of on a roll here. <laughs> and my current employer responds quickly. When I ask them something, the response is quick. The conversation happens. But I've had jobs where if only they would respond to an email, I would feel like I was possibly getting somewhere. In a previous job, we used this creature called Colleague by Illusion. This it's, is or was when I worked for the college a couple of years ago, impossible with JAWS. And I emailed the head of the IT department and I outlined all the myriad ways in which this software was impossible and did not hear back until several months later when I got in trouble for not logging into the system. Well, I didn't log into the system because the system was inaccessible. <laughs> What's the point? I can get nothing of use out of that creature. So just respond have the conversation don't ignore the requests it's frustrating enough that we have to ask for these accommodations because things are not accessible acknowledge it and take it a step further and join us in the fight for access because once we win the fight for access you won't be having to respond to these accommodation requests <laughs> Okay, I'll let somebody else talk. <laughs> That's a good way. I like this answer. Someone else, what are the accommodations that you've worked for? Jacob, Brian? Yeah, um, go ahead, Ryan, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna just uh, add that, you know, sometimes the, the piece about accommodations that's really tricky that I've run across is the folks that are tasked with making the final determinations, I have found don't always assume or don't don't fully understand uh, the good faith basis for the request or the accommodation being asked for. And so it, it's not just the accommodation that we're asking for, it's actually having to demonstrate that we need it to, an, to, a, to somebody who is likely able-bodied who mm -hmm they themselves may not understand the accommodation. And so they, in their, in their view, don't see the necessity in granting it. It's like they're, we're having to not only ask for the accommodation, but prove it to somebody who doesn't need it. So it's kind of this weird um, circle of getting somebody who doesn't need the accommodation to understand why somebody does. And I've fought for things where I've had to talk to HR folks and say, no, no, I need this. I know it doesn't make sense to you, but believe me when I tell you this is what I need. Help me get it so I can do my job effectively. And sometimes they rate it that, sometimes, sometimes not. Sometimes they put up more roadblocks by requesting additional paperwork when the disability is established. Sometimes they will just say flat out, you know, the shortest route to know is, is claiming that something is, is an undue burden, which is the most vague um, 
you know, it's the it's the vaguest wording in in RA accommodation verbiage to say something is an undue burden, and then but that's not really clearly defined because depending on the size of the organization and what the accommodation is, that can vary from place to place. So it gets very convoluted very quickly in a way that it doesn't have to if the folks that are charged with making these decisions choose to believe the folks asking for the accommodations. And I'll pause on that. Mm -hmm. I love what you said. You said, believe me. And that stuck out to me. Like, I know what I need. Trust me. Believe me. But you still have to prove yourself, which is something else you said, which is also something you said, Jacob, earlier. Which is so interesting. Why are we proving ourselves? Go on. Yeah, I feel like there gets to be, and I agree with Ryan. Um, as soon as you ask something, I feel like there gets automatically, there's like this power struggle, right? It's like, why should I have to prove uh, my disability? And the thing that I love is they have these, um, oh, whatever they call them, like DEI specialist or advocate, whatever, so like in a corporate setting. Meanwhile, they don't have a disability. They have some fancy title at the end of their name, but they don't have any like raw experience with a disability, right? It's, I think I saw a meme the other day where, you know, a doctor goes to school for 20 years and they're trying to tell a patient, you know, what they should or shouldn't do to a patient that has the disability their entire life. So it's a, it's a, I mean, it's a struggle. It is a power struggle because you know, corporate has their responsibilities and their, their like fiscal responsibilities. Um, but it's like, I see an accommodation as it's a way to level the playing field, right? It's not, you know, we're not like cheating the system. We're not like trying to take advantage. It's literally a way to level the playing field. Like Ryan said, to just do your job. And I think there's one one thing, uh, Jacob, that your comment reminded me of, and that is you were talking about corporations and organizations that hire DEI uh, specialists. Um, I'm going to take that one step further because I've what I've also seen happen is federal agencies, because they work with contractors quite a bit, um, will hire DEI uh, consultants, and what that can look like is. Um, the organization will have the DEI consultant who is appointed by um, leadership within the agency, and they will maintain their full-time job, which, which whatever it was before they were um, brought on board by leadership, they will maintain their full-time job, and effectively, they are consultants, but they are not actually within the organization, which means that they're not reachable internally for employees who are interested in trying to um, take advantage of this person that's supposed to be an advocate for DEI. And so it, it seems very optics driven. Um, and I, I, have, I have felt like so many organizations are so concerned with the optics, especially in October, but saying we have quotas and metrics to hit and then once October is over, it's like this month never never happened, and that the the, the focus on on disability employment as if we're not trying to do that eleven months you know beyond October, and that's just not true. So sorry, I will pause on that. But your comment made me think of that. This is well, it, it, it's so easy to check a box, right? It's so easy to say. We have a diversity and inclusion specialist. We have an advocate. But if that advocate has zero lived experience with disability, if that advocate hasn't sat down and had heart to heart conversations with actual real life human beings that have a disability, if that advocate is taking a strictly ADA perspective and not a real life human being perspective, then that advocate is next door to useless for those of us humans with disabilities because they don't know what they're doing. So true, so true. 
I do want to acknowledge that we have um, a new person on our panel. So I want to pause and welcome Lucic to, uh, do you want to introduce yourself and um, an image description? Hi everyone, uh, I'm Lucic, pronoun she, her. First of all, I am so sorry for being super late and describing myself, I am Middle Eastern woman with light skin and curly hair. I am currently wearing a um, mustard yellow colored um, sweater. And my background is mainly white. Um, that would be pretty much it, I would say. <laughs> That's awesome. Lucic, so we're actually having a great conversation. And before we move on from this topic, I did want to get your input. So we're talking right. about like the accommodations you request in the workplace, right? You request accommodations, but um, specifically what accommodations have you worked for and some barriers you may have hit? Or do you feel like what would be on your wish list that maybe you never got from your employer? Oh, <laughs> um so where to start um I've, I now know all the accommodations I need to function and there's accommodations that are must for me and there are some that are pretty much I can slowly expose because I know at this point that there are few things that I need, um, but I know that it, if I show all of my cards at the same time, there are going to be employers that are going to be like, oh my gosh, I don't think we can do all of this. So I learned to pretty much do my major ones at first. And then slowly the ones that are not as big of a deal, um, either deal with it or slowly bring those ones up. So like things that are, for example, I have, requirements with like limitations with weight. Like I can't carry anything that's more than right now, seven, eight pounds. That's a big one, right? So that one I have to expose immediately. So that I have to put out there. Um, but there are other things that are not as big of a thing and I kind of either have to deal with it or I have to kind of bring up later like for example I'm super sensitive to smells super 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 and um I have really bad migraines um and with that um being around people that wear perfumes and um, colognes or lotions that have um, scents to them is really difficult and it triggers really, really strong migraines for me. Um, that one, I kind of hang on to it. I'm like, I'll kind of deal with it. So yeah, that's just to say I've learned to right now bring on the ones that are very, very, very important to me immediately and hang on to other ones to bring on later on um, as they come up. Thank you. So I, this is Arielle, I love this concept of um, baby bites of disclosure. And I'm, I'm loving it because I'm actually about to ask a question about when to disclose. 
Um, and so your idea of um, telling your, your big mamas, your must haves right away, and then easing them in or giving them little bits as you go is a good, is an interesting concept. And I think that um, sometimes, but also our, our needs change over time. And so that may also be a good way to like, kind of, you have to baby bite. You don't know what you're going to need a year from now. We didn't know we were going to need work from home accommodations or that they would be available to us. That actually worked out really well for a lot of us. And so um, I really love that idea. So because you brought it up, it eases really well into this question. The next question for everyone is about how you disclose or when you disclose. So um, I'll read it as is, but uh, disclosing a disability or a necessary accommodation can be very personal for some people. So how do you handle disclosure in your workplace? Do you share in the interview process? Um, and we know that for some people, we walk into the room and it's like, oh, you have a disability, I see your disability. But for some people who have invisible disabilities, you can, like Lucic said, kind of like share later some things. So when do you disclose? What do you disclose when you disclose? Who wants to take it on first? I'll, I'll take it. Um, and I, I probably have a unconventional approach to this, uh, but I, it's born out of the knowledge and understanding that, you know, the dis disability in um, uh, survey came out in, in, I think, July or August, talking about how only 4% of um, people are out as disabled at work. That is a staggeringly small percentage when you consider that 20% of the overall population falls into that category. Um, and yet we have even a fraction of that that feels comfortable disclosing. And so the first question that raises to my mind is, well, we have to ask, ask why that is. Is it because um, potential employees or current employees are concerned about perceptions and ability and what that might mean for their future trajectory in the workplace? Is it because they're afraid that that disclosure will lead to some sort of retaliation once they start asking for accommodations and they're gonna have to, to um, you know, try to hang on tighter to the jobs that are suddenly now at risk. Um, and I have taken the approach where, at the, you know, as I'm interviewing for jobs to try to move up and upward mobility is a problem with disclosure too, which is another reason why a lot of folks not, don't choose not to. And so as uh, I interview for jobs, um, because I've gotten to that, that place where mobility in my current role is not, um, is not available, uh, and it's not for lack of skill set, but I have taken the, the approach that when I'm talking to potential new employers, I disclose right out the gate because, and I think of it in the context of saying, when you tell an employer that you have an, that you have a disability and you disclose to them that you have a disability and that you have you have specific needs as a result of that disability, you're telling them one thing about you, and how they respond to that tells you everything about them. And you don't want to end up working for an employer that you've, you know, you've you've hidden your disability or you haven't disclosed it, and then suddenly you've made all these moves and these jumps to this new employer, and you say, "Surprise! Here's what I need." And now you're scrambling to work with an employer who may or may not want to work with you. And but you all, you're also in this catch twenty two because if you disclose too early, you also risk being tossed from the applicant pool way too early. So there, it, there really is a no-win situation, but I have found for myself, and again, I speak only for myself because we're all, we have such diverse folks in this room and on this panel. My experience is, I always tell folks, they're unique to me. You speak, you, if you speak to one disabled person, you've spoken to one disabled person and their experience, and we are not a monolith, but I have, I have found for me better to disclose early and get kicked out of a job that wasn't going to fit you anyway then disclose later because you got the job and suddenly you have needs the employer can't accommodate. And I'll pause on that. Hmm. You know, for me, and if I can jump in here, it, it depends on the circumstances. I have an obvious disability. 
when I walk in with my long white cane, it's pretty obvious that I'm blind. So in the application on the resume in preliminary conversations, I like to get have people know the rest of me. Know me for what I can do. Because when people see a blind person, they have certain ideas about what a blind person is capable of. And those ideas are all too often not conducive to Angela getting hired. But when I applied for the job at Ad Hoc, I actually took a different approach because I was applying for an accessibility position. And I used my real life experience as a person with a disability and as an advocate to build my case for why I should get the job. And <laughs> it worked. <laughs> so ironically, she who did not want to disclose until it became absolutely necessary um, was put in a good position by, by disclosing and by bringing front and center the positive attributes of blindness. Jacob, I heard, I saw you had something in the chat. Do you want to share? For sure. Thank you so much. Um, so I took a very different approach from this. Um, I like what Ryan said about, you know, like you kind of want to disclose as soon as possible, right? Because then it kind of, you can kind of weed out if an employer is inclusive, right? If, if they actually walk the walk, right? And it's not just on the website. So I've done a little bit of everything. I've check the box, I've disclosed an interview, I disclosed after I got the job, all that stuff. Um, I got so fed up with the process, I did something very different. Um, I pushed out content based on my expertise. And I suggest this, you don't have to do it. I mean, you're, it's free will, you can do whatever you want. But what I found effective is I would push out content based on what I do. So I was an educator at the time. And I would fuse in the fact that I also have a disability. What that does, or what I found that it did, is it would um, repel those employers that are not inclusive, and it would attract those that are. It was very powerful, and that's something that a resume cannot do. A resume is one-to-one, -one, right? You submit one resume, one resume goes in, and one resume may get to a hiring manager. Okay, that's a pretty terrible ratio, <laughs> all right? You can have 10 resumes, but you can only submit one at a time. But a piece of content is global, right? It is searchable by pretty much anyone in the world, at least from a LinkedIn perspective. Um, nobody needs to be connected with you. You don't have to have any followers, anything like that. A post is completely searchable by keywords. So if you push out content based on you know, what you do, your expertise, your learning journey, and you fuse in the disability piece, um, you're going to, I feel like it can be like a magnetic force because hiring managers, they're not looking, they're not typing in your first and last name to find you. They don't have your resume. So that's not how they find you. They find you by generic keywords like job titles, cities, skills, certifications, softwares, software used, basically anything in a job description. So when they, when you pop or when you pop up in their search and you're talking about your skill, sprinkle on the fact that you have a disability. I think that can do a lot of things in a positive direction and it can save you a tremendous amount of time, like with the interview process, accommodations, all that, because then you get a glimpse if an employer is actually inclusive. Um, another thing I suggest, suggest is informational interviews. Before you waste all this time with an employer that's not inclusive, see if you can pick their brain, send them a, a personalized invite on LinkedIn and be like, hey, I saw this piece of content on blah, blah, blah. You're really just breaking the ice. That's the purpose of it. Um, and be like, do you mind if I ask you three questions about your, you know, your culture, your disability culture? Um, I noticed on your website, your mission statement said blah, blah, blah. Okay, it's that little bit of extra research that literally takes 40 seconds 
that could be a complete game changer for your career trajectory. A holistic and subliminal disclosure policy. <laughs> yeah, put that on a bumper sticker. <laughs> that is definitely food for thought right there. Lucic, did you have anything you wanted to add to this uh, discussion? Yeah, I have quite a few thoughts. Um, so I have, I want to talk about my approaches and I want to talk about what I think think would be helpful for people to consider for themselves as well. Um, and I want to talk about this idea of invisible versus visible disabilities, because I've been thinking about that a lot lately. Because um, I mean, visible disabilities, that's pretty clear, right? But invisible disabilities, that's the word I've been struggling with a lot. Um, because my invisible disabilities go visible sometimes a lot um, and depends on what day you catch me all of a sudden people be like what's wrong with you what happened right did they see you in like a bandage they see you in big black sunglasses because you have a migraine and a hat um or um they see you um completely wrapped up in your arms or you got um shots all in your neck that's bruised up now and all of a sudden, your invisible disability now is completely visible. So this idea of in invisible becomes visible. Um, or um, my back support that's sitting right here, sometimes I have to carry it with me. Or you might have noticed as I'm sitting, I'm having to fix my shoulders 500 times because I can't sit comfortably at all and I have to fix myself so many times because sitting is uncomfortable for me so that's all to say that there are things some of us just cannot hide um and they just come up and questions come up right um and that also severe depression and all of those things, they're not invisible, they are visible. Um, and sometimes we just have to explain why something is happening. So um, my, a lot of my disabilities have been happening for many years and throughout many jobs or and have been happening school college postgraduate so i've learned whether i wanted to use accommodation not use accommodation how that process is what works what doesn't um even in law school what that process feels like um so what has worked for me personally as i explained uh before the major ones to reveal them but i'm not going to reveal them in the first interview because i'm not shooting myself in the foot because we are in an ableist society mm -hmm. i'm not shooting myself in the foot i am waiting until they fall in love with me so I'm waiting until that maybe last interview until it's in with someone that's higher up in the company and someone that can actually answer my question <laughs> of um, how they're gonna handle my disabilities and are they okay with it? So I actually fully say it. Hey, 
I have this limitations. Is this going to be a problem? Even if they can't say anything in it, the reason I bring it up is because later on when they make me that offer, I'm going to hold them to it. Because it's an oral contract. If they later on say something, oh, you know, it's such a tough one for us to accommodate. I'm going to say, but I brought it up. And you guys said that that was not going to be an issue or you didn't say anything about it or your recruiter didn't say anything about it. I did my due diligence. I brought it up. So I want to make sure that it goes somewhere. It was brought up. And I actually say, you know, I want to make sure that you brought it up with HR and there is not an issue with it. I Everything I look at it is an oral contract or a written contract. So I want to make sure that it's somewhere there because if for any reason they reject my accommodations, I want to bring up the conversation from the beginning. And I've done that before, actually. I've done it before where I said, but I brought it up in the beginning and no one said anything to me. I would have never taken this job if it was an issue. So I always do that where I bring it up in the last interview and I say, I want to make sure I will not take this job unless some like it's fine. It's not a problem with somebody. And if they're being vague, I want to check again. And then, as I mentioned later on, I bring up um, because I know I'm going to utilize accommodations because I need accommodations. For folks that are not going to use accommodations, I it's up to you if you want to bring up your disabilities. But just know that you're exposing yourself to bias. And that's something to keep in mind because we are in an ableist society. If you are someone that quote unquote, benefits from invisibility. So just keep in mind that like, if you're not going to use any accommodations at work, bringing up your disabilities in an interview process could be something that could hurt you with um, that being taken into account, whether they say that they're taking it or not taking it. So just keep that in mind. But for folks that have like, they know they need accommodations, they like they have to bring it up, right? And they they bring it up because they, they wanna hold the company accountable. Orally, they wanna hold them accountable. Sometimes I actually had them even put it in a contract. So like there is ways that you can use that and put it in and uh, other accommodations that just slowly bring it up. And I know the accommodation process pretty well at this point. I mean, accommodation process is something that's like my specialty. So if they deny something, I fight it and my doctor like, he knows the process. I know the process. We go in prepared. And if they say something, I easily fight it. But this is kind of how I go about it. And this is my advice for people that want to bring it up or not bring it up and are kind of debating what to do with it. Thanks. No, thank you. I do have a follow-up question to that, but before I do, I just want to remind people, please put your questions in the chat, um, because after this question, I'm going right to our Q&A, um, our Q&A from the chat. So um, the follow-up question to what you're talking about, Lusek, is, um, you know, how do you feel your specific workplaces are addressing ableism? Because you're saying like you're making them put it in a contract, like, and you're making sure that you're having those difficult conversations. But beyond, you know, accommodations, how do you feel like your workplaces have really been able to address ableism? 
And I feel like we can talk about ableism from one lens, or we can talk about, I don't know, disability pride, I feel like it's a whole nother conversation. Like, how do you think they see you is really kind of the question. And Lucic, you can start if you'd like, or someone else who feels like you have a strong response. So I can start and I'm actually gonna take the question and take a different approach to it. And going with the mindset of putting it in the contract, something that a lot of people that don't talk about, which happens to us disabled folks, um, employers, uh, whenever um, they discriminate against us um, and they want to get rid of us, they and they know we have a pretty solid case for discrimination they end up giving us a non uh, non disclosure agreement and um as an emplo employee that just lost your job you're pretty willing to take it if you're given something in return because you have no idea what's going on. You're given this contract. You're given no time to think about it. So you take it. And you have no idea what you're giving up. So I want to talk about non-disclosure agreements. Um, and I want to first give this kind of note about it. My background is legal. But I want to say I'm no one's attorney and I'm not giving legal advice to anybody. And I have to say this, but I do have some understanding of non disclosure agreements. And non disclosure agreements actually in California are going to change starting January of this year and they're going to be added this uh, piece to them, which is gonna be helping all of us. So just a heads up, California is helping employees. California has always been on the side of employees more, but employees don't understand how the law is helpful because under stress, we're just more willing to take it for what it is. Um, so the way it works, when you're given contract, which is non-disclosure agreement, you're given also time to think about it. It's supposed to be seven days, which I think it might be now five to seven days. Non-disclosure agreements, um, what they can include is this clause that you can't tell anyone whether you were fired or you quit, which can come and bite you when you are applying for unemployment benefits. So just heads up. And that's where it's gonna hurt us because when you're applying for unemployment benefits, you have to have been fired. But if you, you can't say whether you're fired or quit, you can't apply for them. If you haven't been fired and you quit, you have to show the unemployment uh, office that you have been discriminated against. In which case you have to do it through the support of your employer. But guess what? Your employer is now going to let you break that contract. So non-disclosure agreements actually go against uh, your unemployment benefits if you were to get them. So signing that can prevent you from actually getting money through unemployment. So just keep that in mind that little clause in there where it says you can't talk about whether you quit or got fired. 
So I just want our community to know that this little thing that prevents us from talking about that we were discriminated against, that we were fired or laid off or we quit because of being in an ableist um, employer um, environment is actually later on in the long run gonna be much more difficult for us because it will take money away in the long run. And of course, it's good, not gonna happen in every case, but just look at the non-disclosure um, non agreement, really read every clause and look at it in the long run, whether it's gonna hurt you or help you, because what you might be offered it will be less if you look at it in the long run because you might take away that unemployment benefits which you will need until the next employment opportunity comes which for this uh, disabled folks sometimes takes a very long time mm -hmm. i know that was a very long answer but, but it's helpful because in the this. chat, I mean, it impacts a lot of people. Um, we're seeing that a lot of people have been impacted um, by what you're talking about. So, no, that was really important, really um, good information. So I'll throw the question back out um, about how your workplace is addressing ableism. Um, and you can take that from whichever angle works for you. Um, and I'm throwing it back out there. Who's next? You know, I'll take I love, it. I'm oh. saying, you know, I love calling on people. Go no, on. Okay. I'll, I'll take it. Um, there, there's a couple of things that I, there's a couple of things I want to hit on just briefly. Um, to Lucy's point about non disclosures, real quick, um, for, as an advocate, I find them very, um, very tricky because if you're in a position where you sign and they're, this is what they're, they're obviously designed for a very specific purpose and, and, it's potentially damaging because you're not able then to call out an employer, especially within the disability community or elsewhere, to let other other folks know, hey, like this situation happened, like I and you you want to steer people, particularly to, to, um, disabled folks, away from these places. And when these things can't be talked about and they're swept under the rug through non disclosures, um, these things remain hidden. Um, so I'm I'm very weary of them. I've been asked to sign them on a couple of occasions, and I've largely uh, declined to do so. And there's been re repercussions for that. But I don't like being silenced as an advocate to call out employers for bad behavior. Um, well, as for, and I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry for interrupting, but I, I this is at the at the forefront of my mind. Um, can you? Um, experience negative repercussions from refusing to sign the non-disclosure agreement. Um, I'm seeing some head nods, no. Um, and I see some people in the chat who said they refused, but Ryan is saying, ah. I, so I this, this, is, this is exactly, this is, this is exactly the, this is exactly the crux of the problem is because if you're in a situation where you, uh, where you refuse to sign something, then you may not be able to get what you need as a result from it. And so again, there's, again, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but this is my, my lived experience. So it is what it is for me in that there's what can legally happen and there's what you're gonna have to push for because it wasn't supposed to happen a certain way and it did, right? Um, as for the initial question as to, for what employers are doing, I want to take it back to the focus on, on end team for a second. Um, I see a lot of, particularly as this month kicked off, there have been stories everywhere about, about corporations and firms and organizations shouting from the rooftops about, about the optics of disability employment. And then if you open up, you know, any of the, disability headlines and you're, you know, we're as advocates, we're generally steeped in what's going on in a lot of spaces and the number of stories of uh, employers not accommodating employees 
and especially and it happens every day, but it's, I think it's much more front and center right now. And the, the thing that I tell um, folks when I talk to them, you know, across the board, I see agencies and corporations talk about, you know, uh, the value of disability employment and let's talk about the value of, of disabled employees in the workplace and let's have speakers and let's have all of these optical, I mean, I mean I'm gonna call it an optical illusion because that's what it really is. NDEAM to me has two, maybe three focuses. Number one, hire disabled people. Number two, promote them. And as a caveat to one and two, listen to disabled people. If it has nothing to do with those three bullets, Leave it alone. We don't care about your optics for ending. We just don't. And I'm going to pause on. I'm going to pause on that. And I just want to um, take off from the, the the concept of listening. You know, we don't expect that organizations are going to be perfect. Organizations are made up of human beings, and human beings are certainly not perfect. But be willing to learn and grow as an organization. Be willing to allow us to teach you. Because what we, we want, and, and I say we, if you've met one person with a disability, you've met one person with a disability. Most of us want to teach because teaching you makes our lives better. So, so allow us to do that. And accept feedback openly and and not defensively because defensively defensiveness doesn't help anybody you know my my current employer is is open to feedback and they're even brave enough to turn me loose on panel discussions like this so that says a lot of that <laughs> um you know just, just just be be willing to learn and grow because we're all learning and growing and i'll i'm starting to ramble so i'll go i'll let somebody I'll, else have the microphone for a minute i want to just, just one second i want to say one thing if i can um when we're talking about accommodations and what what is and is not feasible and what can and cannot happen i want to remind everybody um when i talk to them through um, through my employer or whoever I'm talking to in whatever context, this reminder that accommodation, there is a big distinction between something being, being compliant and being accessible. And they're not the same thing. Amen. Compl compliance is the, the floor, not the ceiling. And those two things are very different. And that's something that I want employers to really understand and i'm going to pause on that yes <laughs> preach it angela love that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh um, man did anyone else have any thoughts on this question before we go into our q a we have some really good questions coming in i just want to answer angela's question um as far as whether ndas can be refused to be signed Yes, absolutely, because NDA at the end of the day is just a contract. Just if you think about it, it's like it's like a cell phone contract. Can you just not pick that cell phone surface service? Yes, you pretty much just decide not to pick that service. So it's a contract in exchange for something. So you just don't sign it and don't take what it gives you. So NDAs usually give you in exchange uh, something, for example, medical insurance, they give you severance check. Um, so you just don't take it. You refuse all of it. Uh, so you can't take the money with the contract. Uh, so you have to just refuse all of it. So you can absolutely just not take the NDA, but you would be refusing all of it. Gotcha. Thank you for that answer. Of course. 
All right, let's jump into some chat Q and A's. Um, so one question that came in said, what would you tell a disabled person who is feeling like it is hopeless for them to find a job? Keep trying, just push, you know, you have skills. You have, you have marketable skills, whatever those skills may be. Be confident in the skills that you have and put those skills to the for, at the forefront. You know, I, I tell people, sometimes it takes a hundred no's to get to yes. And like somebody said earlier, if they tell you no, you probably didn't want to work for them anyway. But it only takes one yes. Keep the faith, keep trying, keep applying, keep learning, keep honing your skills until you get to that yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else, some uh, words of wisdom, some advice? Yeah, I'll pet take it for a second. Oh, um, I mean, I would say constantly test the market. Um, if what you're doing is not working, you got to, you got to pivot, you got to try something else. Um, you know, there's the expression, don't beat a dead horse. So like I mentioned the whole, you know, resume, at least from a U.S. perspective, like, yeah, you need a resume, but really it's an administrative courtesy, right? People on LinkedIn, on other platforms, Twitter, um, people land roles in direct messages, Right, Clubhouse business development deals go down on Clubhouse. Like I've seen it happen. Um, so I say that to be like, your resume is not your only strategy. There are so many ways to find work. The most basic way is push out bite-sized pieces of content that display what you do for an employer or what you can do for an employer. So for example, um, if you do your research on like your favorite tech company, and you notice there might be like a problem that you can solve for them, create an MVP, create a most viable product, right? Like who's to say you can't make a simple five point, you know, five slide Google slide deck that could potentially solve one of their pain points. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but like you gotta show your hustle online um, and you can't do that with bullet points and dates of employment. And I just wanted to just take that, Jacob. It's such a that's such a resonating thing uh, for me. I have a background that's primarily in communication, so I'm fortunate that the advocacy that I do, independent of my of my um, federal job, actually serves to that point. Right, the communication and the advocacy that I do, my ability to communicate from an advocacy standpoint, also shows employers that I can put together a persuasive message uh, through my advocacy and they can expound upon that for their needs. Um, and I, I found so, the, and it goes well with your advice from earlier in the session about pushing out that content because you never know who's looking at it, where they're finding it. And it's a great sorting hat to, to keep those employers who it doesn't resonate with away from you. Uh, so that's, I'm just, I'm putting a, thumbs up on that idea because I've seen it work directly. And another thing, yeah, absolutely, Ryan. Um, another thing, you don't need to be a company to have your own brand. You can be a job seeker with a brand, right? So if you are like, um, you wanna be a, a corporate trainer, for example, you could be like the, the corporate trainer extraordinaire. Um, there are sites online Fiverr.com, like they have very, very inexpensive. You can make a brand, you can make a logo for $5. Like you could do things on the lean, lean, lean. Um, I pitched a concept to Google for $5 to the, to one of the founding fathers of the internet. Like anything's possible. If you, if you have the drive, the hustle, people with disabilities are some of the most tenacious, like hustle driven people I've ever met. So we, like they always say, you know, you got to think outside the box. When you're a person with a disability looking for work, there is no box. The box has been kicked to the curb and ready for recycling. Like we do it every day, right? We solve our own problems 
So you gotta just, you gotta just move forward. Um, if you need any help with that, like I do this like 24 hours a day. So I like dream content, um, appropriate content, of course. Um, so you gotta just push out your journey. That is like the best piece of advice is like document the living daylights out of your journey. To Jacob's point about, about the creativity that disabled folks bring to the organization, I have seen it framed so often that the disabled employee and their accommodation is an undue burden, that it creates a problem for the organization, that it creates um, an unnecessary hurdle. And I come back at that at that with the with the phrasing that we because as Jacob points out we are living in a world that is not built for us so we are problem solvers by nature if we, we as disabled em employees are going to solve way more problems than the perception that we create them. Amen. Um, and that's, yeah, and that's something that I think I, I want to shout from the rooftops all month and all year. And allow us, you know, it, allow us to be a part of the problem solving process in terms of accommodations, because we've been doing this all our lives. And chances are good, we can come up with a solution that is less expensive, less time consuming, and less problematic than the solution that you know, you, you might think is necessary. We're, you, and you're right, we're, we're, we're problem solvers, we have to be problem solvers because the world was not built <laughs> for people with disabilities. So we're gonna we figure this stuff out. I've been figuring this stuff out for 40 years. So I think I can help you figure it out in terms of my own blindness accommodations. So it sounds like almost everyone on this call is an advocate of some sort or a side hustle, as you mentioned, uh, Jacob, side hustle, DEI consultant or full time um, in your case, uh, Lucic. So can someone, someone put in the chat actually asking, like, what is that starting point you'd recommend and um, for someone who wants to pursue like DEI consulting? And I, Jacob, you're really good with like, job seeking, you know, content creating, that's really like your jam. But then I know some other people are like DEI. So like, I don't know if we want to pair these two together um, to give some specific advice for if you want to make DEI your side hustle. So since DEI is my hustle, <laughs> maybe I'll start off. Um, yeah. Um, how to go about it. First of all, if you wanna do DEI as a full-time thing, right now, don't do it. Don't quit your day, day, day job, don't. Um, it's right now in a really, really terrible job market uh, for it, like really bad. Everyone's quit, like quitting to go into it. it it's not it. It's not, it's not it. And I'm going to be very, very, very blunt and honest to you. Unless you're a white person, it's, it's not going to be it. Right now, um, companies are still in their performative stage. They are still looking for those, they're looking still someone that's quote unquote safe to hire. So they're looking for someone that is white, that has their, um, they got their certificate from Cornell. Um, they're not looking for someone that comes from community there that has been impacted they're not looking for someone that actually has years of experience they're not looking for someone um that lived it briefed it so yeah especially if you are 
a person of color, you are transgender, don't. Don't quit your day job. You're not going to be making money. Just a heads up, very, very few of us are getting actual money. Very few of us. And those are folks that like really found a way or started it before 2020 because that was like a really pivotal point before George Floyd's murder. So there's just a lot that's happening. Companies are very performative. The market is oversaturated. The certificates are really killing the DEI field and making it something that it shouldn't be, just way too mainstream. Um, and the uh, DEI certificates aren't even teaching about disability rights. They aren't teaching most of them about LGBTQ rights. So there's just so much I can talk about it. So this is just a very honest opinion of a immigrant woman of color mm -hmm. that's disabled that has been doing this for years. But do it as a side hustle. Do speaker stuff. Do it from there. Like write stuff on LinkedIn. Write blog posts. I think those are the best ones. Like write blog posts. Write your experiences. Those are the things that actually still working. Like, and I find my joy in that like putting my experiences down and having people that are like, yeah, exactly. That same thing happened to me. When I talk about my experiences with accent and someone else is like, wait, same thing for me. So like do that. But if you're gonna go your your experience like what you're imagining is you're going to go into a big company and be their DEI person and save that company not it that's not going to happen mm -hmm. so I'm just being very real about it money in it is not going to happen so but for people with a lot of privilege <laughs> around light skin and being white with Cornell um certificates yeah that might be it um and i'm being very realistic as someone that is in the field thanks Thank lucy i do want to plug that you keep mentioning cornell because it's a very specific um dei diversity equity and inclusion e-certificate that has been like you'll see it sponsored on your social media right now um, and that's why you, she keeps mentioning it. So if you're wondering why she yeah. keeps mentioning Cornell, it's not a commercial for Cornell. It's, no. it's just that it's, um, this is just yeah. a heavily promoted um, online certificate program for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yeah. In the DEI world, Cornell is like the it kind of thing. It's the heavily sponsored uh, thing. Everyone's like, oh, I should get it from Cornell. If I'm going to get it from somewhere, I should get yeah. it from Cornell. <laughs> I understood, but I was like, I don't know if everyone has seen these sponsored ads or if it's only those of us who are really like in the space. So I figured I'd put the plug. Um, did anyone else want to add to this? We have about five more minutes and I did want to give everyone a chance to give a, do a lightning round of closing thoughts. So if anyone has really strong feelings about this question, um, I'll give you a moment, but if not, we'll do our lightning round. All right, lightning round it is. Definitely start as a side hustle. So side hustle first. Yeah, you, you gotta dip your toe in the water, right? Don't don't go all the way in. Um, in the wise words of the king of pop, Michael Jackson, don't stop till you get enough. Like I love it. do as much as you want, but like you gotta pay the bills. So mm. do what you wanna do in order to do what do what you have to do in order to do what you wanna do. Oh yeah. That's the truth. 
I will do a plug right now. Um, if you're not following all of these amazing panelists on social, please do. Um, I think everyone's social has been dropped in the chat at some point, but feel free to drop your socials in the chat so everyone can find you. Um, I don't think anyone wants to follow me, but feel free. Um, I'm not going to drop my social in the chat, but feel free uh, to find me. And yeah, because I feel like everyone wants to follow up. We still had some unanswered questions. So, um, all right, lightning round. The question is, and lightning round because you get like one sentence, less than a minute, serious, five minutes left. The question is, how do we not lose this momentum after National Disability Employment Awareness Month is over? Um, how do we not lose this momentum to keep um, disability pride and anti-ableism going within our workplaces? And I'm going to go in order of how I see you. I'm starting with Ryan. Oh, the pressure's on. Um, I mean, if we knew how to keep the momentum, we would, we would be putting ourselves out of business when it came to... like. I always say I I, I want to get to a point where where disability isn't novel and we're not celebrating it for a month and doing this thing. How do we do that? By continuing to to fight and advocate and show employers that we have value and wisdom that we can that we can better their organization and that we are are smart and dedicated. With you know, Steve Jobs said we you know we hire people not to tell them what to do, but because we we hire smart people and we, and we get out the get out of the way. Mm -hmm. And that's what we need employers to do. Mm -hmm. That was good. And in less than a minute, so good job. <laughs> Angela, you're next. Humans talking to other humans, mm -hmm. teaching, learning, sharing. Let's change society's attitude about disability one human being at a time. That's good. Succinct. Jacob, you're next. So in my experience, um, from a from a psychological psychological perspective, um, people engage with storytelling. So it doesn't matter what the platform is. So if you want to keep the, the movement going, um, what I like to do is like create instead of one post, create a series of content. So take a high level topic for the week, whatever you want, disability, accommodations, whatever, and then create micro pieces of content Monday. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for the week based on the macro. You keep the rhythm going and like, I mean, that's how you develop a brand, things like that. Um, I've been doing a thing called Dear Disability, kind of like Dear Abby, but it's all about disability. So that's how you create, like people remember those things, right? You, you can play off of things that are, you don't have to reinvent the wheel is what I'm saying. Love it. And Lucic, round us out. I would say do exactly what you're doing now, which is go to talks about disability. Um, share with others your favorite books about disability. Your favorite speakers who are disabled. Um, your favorite podcasts that talk about some type of disability like put put the disability community out there so more people can see themselves represented because I think a lot of people don't understand how big the disability community is they don't see themselves as part of it and when they see someone like them out there, they realize they're part of it. Um, I was talking to someone that has lupus and she didn't realize she was part of the disability community. Like our community is so loving and accepting and welcoming. So let's put ourselves more out there let's share more events let's share more of our leaders um and let's put our pride out there and our pride is in the people that we have the wonderful leaders voices that we have um and in that 
we will show people that like if you do have a disability hey there is a welcoming spot out here for you like come tell us like we will be here we'll be welcoming we'll be supportive there is a community out here so that's my thought thank you so much and thank you to all of our panelists for just your amazing contributions and thoughts and honesty and realness all night and day um and everywhere we have realized we had some people even from the philippines which really made me excited so we are crossing um all the borders i'm really excited um and please join us next we have these conversations throughout the year so um join us next month um we, next month we're chatting about disability and the metaverse so we really hope you'll join us and thank you everyone have a good night for me i'm in new jersey so good night um on my end but good day for you Take care.